thank you all for being here, friends, and for the many things that we have enjoyed over the years together. Thanks to Donna Lee, who serves on the BYU Studies Advisory Board, Spencer, Shirley, for all these years we have spent together, and all of you, my colleagues. I also express great appreciation to the many BYU administrators who have made this kind of work at BYU possible. Thanks to my fellow editors, staff, authors, and interns who have worked with me at BYU Studies. Thank you all for being here, and I am glad to recognize Mark and Laura Willis. And also want to mention Paul Huskison, who as the director of the Willis Center asked me a few years ago to deliver this uh, distinguished Willis Lecture. Mark and his wife, Kina, are serving now uh, uh, as missionaries in the Washington, D.C. Temple. And above all, I want to pause to remember tonight Elder Neal A. Maxwell. We miss him. We miss his kindness, wisdom, devoted scholarship, all of which left especially deep impressions on me and all who knew him. Who can forget statements by him like, all knowledge is not of equal significance. Something might be factual, but unimportant. Without divine guidance, our cerebral calisthenics, though often fascinating to engage in, can be empty exercises. Faith is not devoid of intellectual content, nor is it anti-reason. But spiritual things belong to an encircling and larger realm. This realm, he said, has its own culture, its own evidence, its own interior consistency, and indeed its own language. LDS scholars can and should speak in the tongue of scholarship, but without losing the mother tongue of faith. May his legacy always be with us. I pray that tonight we may seek and find important facts that will serve wise purposes, be guided by the Holy Ghost, and be expressed in the mother tongue of faith. It was, in fact, a wise question that Elder Maxwell asked me in 1985 about how long it took Joseph to translate the Book of Mormon that launched me on my 30-year involvement with this subject. That began with a 1986 Farms Preliminary Report and has, been, has seen its latest development this year in the second edition of Opening the Heavens, this book and the chart that's in your program tonight uh, comes out of six pages in that book. My purpose tonight, I hope, is to get us all thinking a little more specifically than ever before about the amazing and illuminating timing of the translation of the Book of Mormon. It was Oliver Cowdery who said, those were days never to be forgotten. Now, as my title suggests, we can be more specific about those days, even those hours and sometimes minutes. Oliver said, to sit under the sound of a voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven awakened the utmost gratitude in the soul. I too hope to awaken a greater sense of gratitude in our hearts for this miraculous volume of scripture. After a quick review of the scholarship on the subject of the timing of the translation, I will examine five anchor dates in this chronology. I will then turn to the questions, how long did it take and why has there been some variety in the various estimates? We will see that these estimates are basically all in the same ballpark once a few key terms and a couple uncertainties have been more closely examined. I then will examine, will then emphasize how many things were going on in the months of April, May, and June of 1829, and will consider the possible rates of translation in terms of words per minute and hours per day. This will open up to us many reasons why the detailed information that will be presented can be highly useful to us in improving our understanding, interpretation, and appreciation of the Book of Mormon. Now, this is a tall order. I will try to move quickly and concisely through the vast amount of documentation that stands behind all of this. 
A quick mention of the previous scholarship will set the stage. A century ago, people had to work with very limited available information. In 1909, B.H. Roberts generally concluded that the translation, which began on April 7th, was completed somewhere between the early part of June and sometime in August 1829. That would take somewhere between 60 or as many as 120 days. A carefully written article in 1941 was published in the Improvement Era by the meticulous Francis W. Kirkham and concluded that the translation took about 75 working days. But he and almost everyone else at that time thought that Joseph commenced in April with 1 Nephi chapter 1 and did not pick up then in Mosiah where the lost 116 pages had left off. Thus Kirkham wondered how long into July the translation may have continued. Kirkham's suggestion that the Book of Mormon was translated within 75 working days amazed people. And Fawn Brody countered Kirkham's estimate of this phenomenally short time, as she called it, simply by asserting that Martin Harris, after all, had been taking dictation from Joseph Smith for some time before April 7. But no evidence has turned up that Harris took any dictation after June 1828, even during his short visit to Harmony in March 1829. At that time, he was embroiled in a lawsuit brought against him by his wife, Lucy, seeking to prohibit him from having any further dealings with Joseph Smith. After the Farms and Encyclopedia of Mormonism publications in the early 1990s, a burst of interest about Joseph Smith flourished at the time of the Joseph Smith Bicentennial in 2005. From 2002 to 2005, the translation topic was mentioned, mostly in passing, in as many as eight publications by authors including Robert Remini, Terrell Givens, Milt Backman, Dan Vogel, and Richard Bushman. But really, little new information was added. Also in 2005, the first edition of Opening the Heavens appeared, published by BYU Studies. It contained a lengthy day-by-day -day chronology of the events in 1828 to 1829, published there for the first time. In the next decade, bits of new information were suggested. Such was commonly stated. The pace of translation was stunning, about eight pages per day. Remarkable even for skilled translators, said Rick Turley. Michael McKay and Garrett Dirkmatt in 2000 and 2015 have cautiously concluded that, quote, nearly all of the Book of Mormon was translated in quote, less than 90 days. Now, less than 90 days can be 12. Oh, well, maybe he meant a little closer to 90. But. <laughs> Obviously, there have been some differences of opinion here, but a general consensus has emerged on many of the most important points. And even the 90-day maximum estimates are still within the phenomenally amazing range. Of course, in some respects, all this is still a work in progress. We yet publish, we yet puzzle over and cannot be absolutely certain about every data point in this story, but we can be more confident about many things than we were even a decade ago, as I think all would agree. As Richard Bushman has said, in laying open all the crucial documents for inspection with enough commentary to put them in context, nothing could be more helpful and inspiring. Turn now, if you will, with me to the chart in your program. There you will find, beginning with the opening middle page, all the uh, certain dates and lines that are bolded. I call these anchor dates. What you, what you think about the timing and sequence of the translation of the Book of Mormon depends largely on what you think about those particular dates. Now, history is admitted, admittedly an inexact science, dependent to a large extent upon accidental survival of information and personal memory. 
So in stabilizing historical judgments, one always looks for, looks for certain anchor points that hold in place the structural girders of our historical understanding. While welcoming any new information or feedback about the timing of the translation of the Book of Mormon, I propose that these five anchor dates in particular can be tied down with near historical certainty. They are based on credible, contemporaneous, primary sources found in independent documents. They show that, with the possible exception of a page or two, the entire Book of Mormon came forth day after day and hour by hour between April 7 and June 30. Such precision regarding the foundational events of any new religious movement is, in and of itself already, thoroughly amazing, and as far as I know, unequaled, for which we all can be very grateful. Well, anchor date number one, April the 7th, on the left side of the center page of your program, is when Oliver Cowdery commenced work as a scribe for Joseph on April the 7th, 1829, in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Support for this dating has long come from the September 7, 1834 letter of Oliver Cowdery, printed in the Messenger and Advocate. It says that he arrived in Harmony for the first time in the early evening of Sunday, April 5th, and he began working as scribe for Joseph on April 7th. Is this credible? Everyone seems to agree on this date. But could Oliver really remember that date five and a half years later in 1834? And if he came on April 5th, what did they do on Monday, April 6th? We now know. Not long ago, Gordon Madsen found in the local Pennsylvania courthouse legal papers for the sale by Joseph Smith of his property in Harmony to George Noble, a local businessman. These 1831 legal documents, fortunately included in their historical collection, the original agreement between Joseph Smith and Emma's father, Isaac Hale, proving absolutely that on April 6th, Joseph Smith became the legal owner of that property. Two signatures officially witnessed this agreement on April 6th. Down here at the bottom, one of them, Oliver Cowdery, and the other, Samuel H. Smith. So we now know what the business was that was conducted on April the 6th. Samuel, then a 20-year-old, had already been in harmony for a few weeks, having come in March with Joseph Smith Sr. to help Joseph on his farm. On that April 6th, Joseph paid Isaac Hale $75 and promised to pay the balance in the future. And we see the receipt and payment schedule on the back of this document, which was folded in half long ways and attached to the back of these legal documents, as was normally done in collecting legal files in those days. This legal transaction gave Joseph Smith ownership and the legal right to say who could and could not come onto his property and into his log cabin there in Harmony. With that, Joseph had finally a degree of essential security so that even Isaac Hale and any others could not disturb the translation process. With that, the very next day, Joseph and Oliver commenced work. Thus, anchor date number one is secure. Before that date, and without that property security, little translation could take place before 1829. Of course, the year before, the 116 pages were translated with Martin as the main scribe. Emma and Reuben Hale apparently acted as scribes in those months as well. It may well be that when Emma said in 1856 that she wrote a part of the Book of Mormon, a part of it, she wasn't clear exactly what she meant, she was referring, I think, to the time when Joseph had said to Emma that he was surprised to read that Jerusalem had walls. 
But that text about Jerusalem and Sarah, she says, meaning Sariah, would have been encountered either at the beginning of the lost book of Lehi, translated in April 1828, or at the beginning of 1 Nephi, translated in June 1829. Now, as people used to think that 1 Nephi was translated in April of 1829, you can see how that might have still been something that Emma could have done. But I think that Emma's recollection here should be dated back earlier and thus cannot really be solidly counted as something as having been translated and her working as a scribe between September 1828 and April 7th, 1829 the crucial beginning of the translation of what we now have in the Book of Mormon. Seven documents say very little, if anything, was translated before April 7th, 1829. I won't go into all seven of those, but the evidence comes from these. One, Oliver said of the Book of Mormon to William Frampton, I wrote it, with the exception of a few pages, with this right hand, extending his right hand as the, the inspired words, he said, fell from the lips of Joseph Smith. David Whitmer once said that a few pages were written by Emma, John Whitmer, and Christian Whitmer. But here David must be talking about the writing of 1 Nephi at his father's home in Fayette in June 1829 when John Whitmer and Christian Whitmer were involved but not likely about anything before April 7th. Third, Lucy Smith will say in her memoir, Emma had so much of her time taken up with her housework that she could write but little for him. But even here, Lucy gives no hint about when or what even that little might have consisted of. Fourth, in March 1829, in a revelation, Doctrine and Covenants, now section five, given to Martin Harris, Joseph was told to translate a few more pages and then to stop for a season. He may have translated a page or two, we don't know, in March. Whether he translated even that much remains uncertain. We do know, however, that he stopped, waiting for Oliver Cowdery to come. For in 1832, Joseph Smith wrote, the Lord had appeared to Oliver Cowdery, and he was desirous to come to write for me to translate. Now my wife had written some for me to translate, which may refer to a page or two at the beginning of Mosiah. We don't know for sure. Then when Isaac Hale was about to, Joseph says, turn me out of doors, Oliver finally came. And the property was purchased. Now, during those stressful days, it is no wonder that only a very little was written on the Book of Mormon project or anything else at that time. Thus, I show only Mosiah chapter 1 on the chart as coming before April 7, 1829. If we only had the original manuscripts for the Book of Mormon for the first part of the Book of Mosiah, which we do not, we could know this detail for sure. I've gone through this anchor date uh, number one uh, rather carefully because this is the only evidence for a possible caveat to seeing April 7th as the commencement of the translation of the Book of Mormon. Anchor date number two on the chart. This, by the way, is the reconstruction of the Joseph Smith cabin in Harmony, where the translation that we're now talking about took place. Let's stay there for a minute. Anchor date number two. On May 15 on the chart, this is on the right side of the center page, Joseph and Oliver reached the middle of 3rd Nephi before May 15, 1829. How do we know this? From the testimonies of Oliver and Lucy Max Smith, in 1834, Oliver said, after writing the account of the Savior's ministry to the remnant of the seed of Jacob upon this continent, 
Joseph and Oliver saw that, quote, none had authority from God to administer the ordinance of the gospel. And this led to the appearance of John the Baptist. Early in draft three of the History of the Church, which was written in 1838 to 1841, the date of the baptism was actually given as May 15th, 1829. And third, interestingly, in 1844, Lucy added, one morning, and that would be May 15th, they sat down to their usual work when the first thing that presented itself to Joseph was a commandment from God that he and Oliver should repair to the water, each of them to be baptized. So they were not translating 3 Nephi chapters 11 to 12 that day, which led them to wonder about being baptized. They had already translated those two chapters the day or two before, in which they would have encountered 19 dense occurrences of the word baptize and learned of Jesus giving 12 the authority to baptize. On the next morning, they were then commanded by the Lord to go forth and be baptized. Samuel was baptized 10 days later, May 25th. The process is right on schedule to finish the large, large plates by the end of May, assuming a regular steady pace of translation throughout. We now go to anchor date three. On the bottom of the third page of the chart, that's the next page over. The title page of the Book of Mormon was translated on or shortly before May 31st, 1829. Joseph Smith said that it was, quote, the very last leaf on the left-hand side of the collection or book of the large plates. The fact that the copyright application for the Book of Mormon contained the full text of the Book of Mormon title page and was filed on June 11, 1829, confirms that the title page and the last books of the large plates must have been translated before June 11. In addition, the title page was published on June 26 in the Wayne Sentinel, a Palmyra newspaper before the translation of the small plates was completed the end of June. So again, the title page must have come at the end of the large plates. And those were finished before the end of May. Okay. Well, anchor date number four. But is this June 11th date trustworthy? This is the date on which the copyright application was filed and secured. Now we have long had a copy of the copyright form. It looks like this. As you can see, a corner is torn off of it. It's been folded and used. And the validity of this tattered copy could have been questioned until the official court version of that document was found, and here it looks like this, in 2005 in the Library of Congress. The Joseph Smith copy was apparently a secondary personal copy that he had retained. This is the official copy signed on June 11th by R.R. Lansing, clerk of the district court in Utica, New York, perfecting this filing. As a previous unknown bonus, the attached, oh, you can see here, here's the, uh, uh, an up close of that uh, page, and you can see clearly the 11th day of June in the 53rd year of the independence of the United States. <laughs> For legal purposes, after all, the world began with the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and uh, what you see here, the Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon. What's this? This whole text is the title page of the Book of Mormon. And the copyright law, the federal copyright law, law required that you had to submit the title of a book. And so Joseph handed in the whole title page. As you may know, in the uh, early 19th century and before, 
People like to give very expansive titles to books, and this is about as expansive as you'll ever see. But he wanted to know, he wanted people to know, this is what is being uh, filed and secured. Now this is uh, also interesting is that together with this filed copyright was this printed page. Now this is an added bonus. Uh, this single sheet of the title page was printed on a letterpress, folded again as was done with legal documents, identified and dated. You can see the, uh, the fold mark here in the middle, and if you turn to the back, you'll see the case name, Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, Jr., and the official filing date. No doubt about June 11th, 1829. We also don't know, however, uh, who delivered this certificate to the court. Was it Joseph, Oliver, Martin? Whoever took it probably would have needed about six to seven days round trip from Fayette to Utica for someone to file it, unless it was submitted by mail, we just don't know. It is true that Oliver Cowdery's handwriting was not found on the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon for the stretch between 1 Nephi 4.20 to 1 Nephi 16.1, which was then being translated at the Whitmer Farm in Fayette. Uh, so maybe Oliver was gone delivering this, but even then I don't think he could have gotten there and back in the short time that that would have allowed. Martin Harris seems to me to be more available and would have had the greatest interest for financial reasons in seeing that the copyright was secured. Larry Porter thinks that it was Martin who did that. Our fifth anchor date, page five of the chart, is the completion date by the end of June 1829. This date also is quite well established. David Whitmer stated that the translation at my father's occupied about one month, that is from June 1st to July 1st, 1829. And many details corroborate this timing and numerous interconnections between other specific events and the progress of the translation can be drawn. For the remaining issue of the translation, which this is the upstairs room in the Whitmer home, continuing, so, did translation continue after June 30 then becomes the final question here. And some people have wondered, did they keep working after June 30? There's actually no documentary evidence of any kind for this, and it is hard to find a place and a time when any of that could have occurred. For example, by the 1st of July, Joseph had relocated to Manchester uh, and that's where Joseph and Martin began contacting printers. Joseph met unsuccessfully with Grandin in Palmyra, and then with another printer, Thurlow Weed in Rochester, New York, a fair distance northwest of Palmyra. Then he met successfully with Elihu Marshall, a Quaker book publisher, also in Rochester, and finally successfully again with Grandin in Palmyra. Lots of meetings, lots of travel there in the first part of July. And Joseph was with Martin during most of that time and never with Oliver, as far as we know, who was in Fayette. Negotiations with the printers could have begun in June, but it makes a lot more sense for most of that to have occupied Joseph's attention in July. To all of this information can be added further documentation from the manuscripts themselves. Royal Skousen has shown, quote, there are very few signs of any editing or Joseph changing his mind about the translation, whether during the translation or at any time afterwards in the original manuscripts. The original manuscript was not even in Joseph's possession during, after June 30th, if he had wanted to make changes in it. Oliver had the original manuscript and he was in Fayette in July, Oliver began to copy 
uh, the whole project over, creating the printer's manuscript so they could get the book to press. So, in answering the question, how many days did it take, how precise can we be? I will try to be as simple as possible here as we do some math. When we start with the total number of days from April 7th to June 30 inclusive, we get 85 days. That's where that number comes from in some estimates. Other estimates mention 75, 65, 63, or 60 days. Several just say eight printed pages a day, which actually would be 66 days to do the 531 pages of the current Book of Mormon, or 74 days for the 589 pages of the 1830 edition. We don't know which edition people think of when they say eight pages. These differences occur because we know that not all of these days were available for translation work. But we don't know for sure which days to exclude from whatever total you're beginning with. On the chart in your program, you'll see that I have excluded 11 full days. These are days like May 18th to 19th or June 1st to 4th time spans when Joseph may, or either we know he was or could have been on trips or otherwise was identifiably, identifiably occupied, on which days I think no translation could possibly have occurred. It's not crucial when in the time frame the trip to Colesville fell. It's only crucial that we know that they went there and it must have taken at least two days and maybe longer. So 85 days gets reduced by 11 to produce the number 74, which you'll see on the last page of my chart, giving the, the maximum number of possible days available for translation. You follow what's happening there? Now, in addition, let's not forget that there were probably also a lot of other days that were partially unavailable, other trips, business, farming, chores, personal time, visitors who come, and actually quite a few visitors do, some wanted and some unwanted. Sundays, we have 16 Sundays uh, to deal with. How much did they work on Sunday? Oh, they didn't work on Sunday. Now, this was the Lord's business anyway. but. They may have reduced, I, I think they did, I think they translated, I think they had to in order to get it done in the time frame that they had. But I've reduced the rate on the chart so that Sunday isn't quite as heavy a day. Now that's speculation, but if you add all of these things up when days might have had half-time distractions or interruptions, I think that this would account for about 16 days worth of, uh, of halftime interruptions. So that takes our number from 74 down to 58. 58 days. And one more day needs to be reserved for time enough to work in to this same time period 13 revelations that are now in, doctrine and, in the Doctrine and Covenants. The total number of words in those 13 revelations, 6,124. Assuming a fairly quick pace of 20 words per minute to dictate and someone to transcribe those revelations would take five hours. And then if we include some time for interviewing, talking to, delivering the revelation to the recipient, that's got to take a little time. I've added one more day to the reduction. So we now are down to 57 uh, possible days. Let me add that on the chart, you will see these Doctrine and Covenants sections pegged on a particular date. Those dates, of course, are speculative. We know that some of these revelations came in April and some in June. 
You'll see that I have put them on particular dates. It doesn't really matter uh, when they fall on the timeline if all we're interested in is the total amount of time that these uh, matters all consumed. For here is yet another whole series of interruptions and a second project layer on top of all that Joseph was already doing with the Book of Mormon translation. But it's also interesting and quite remarkable how these Doctrine and Covenants sections connect with the unfolding of materials in the Book of Mormon. Now I need to lead most, leave most of this topic for another day as it doesn't relate to the timing issue per se, but you will note how these sections have been placed on the chart where some of their phrases actually connect with Book of Mormon texts translated at that time. And this actually happens quite often and in some interesting patterns. So on April the 6th, uh, uh, let's go with April the 9th, what is DNC section 8, I've placed at about the time of Mosiah 8, uh, for several reasons. Both uh, Mosiah 8 and Section 8 deal with the power to translate. On April 26th, you will see that phrases in Doctrine and Covenants 9 connect with things in Alma 11 or Alma 40. So I put it there. I put Doctrine and Covenants 7 back on May 21st, due to strong connections there coming out of 3 Nephi 28, relating to, in that case, in the Book of Mormon, the three witnesses, but in, the, in section 7, talking about why it was that John the Apostle was allowed to uh, not taste death. On May 31st, the phrase, deny not, appears in section 11 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And I connect that with the nine conspicuous deny nots found in Moroni chapter 10. And since that revelation was given to Hiram and we know that he came right at the very end of May, that also dovetails very nicely. So you see how this works. On June, 20, on June 14th, since Doctrine and Covenants 1810, reads, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God, and that very phrase is quoted in the letter uh, that was uh, written uh, on uh, a few days later uh, to, uh, and I don't have that in front of me, but it's, uh, it's quoted in the letter from, as well as other passages so I've dated that around June 11th. Anyway, this is kind of confusing, a lot of details, but uh, I think they're important and explaining to you how to use the chart that you now can go and understand. So here we have section 18 about June 9th. We don't have an original manuscript of that. The earliest is the Book of Commandments publication. But one more. Quite stunningly, a two-page document entitled Articles of the Church of Christ was composed by Oliver Cowdery sometime in June. It just says June on the document, and it is another 1,551 words long. How long did this, this take him to do? The good part of another day, I would think. And although this doesn't take away from Joseph translating the Book of Mormon, if Oliver isn't available, it may cut into the uh, overall time for the uh, translation of the Book of Mormon. So I've put this on June 21st and assumed that there was no Book of Mormon translation going on on that Sunday. Now this document also quotes from the recently received section 18, which was given to Oliver and David Whitmer, but it also meaningfully and expertly quotes from the original manuscript, and we know that the that the texts here, these are coming, this is Oliver Cowdery's handwriting, but it comes right out of passages from the Book of Mormon. But it's not from the 1830 edition, it's not from the printer's manuscript, it's from the original manuscript. So Oliver has the original manuscript, but there's no index to the original manuscript, right? But he has gone through and he has found 
36 verses, and here they are, 36 verses that he quotes in the original manuscript form. Well, Oliver's writing of this document took time to locate, organize, and quote these passages exactly. And listen to the powerful summary of the administrative provisions that Oliver had pulled out of the Book of Mormon already, long before the church was even organized, to be used based on the administrative guidance found in the Book of Mormon. He quotes passages dealing with the performance of the ordinance of baptism, ordaining elders, administering the, the sacrament, handling excommunications, the laws of the church, blessings, authority, preparing to stand before Christ and being saved eternally in his kingdom through his infinite atonement. Not bad for a summary on the job. So now you can see how uh, the chart in your hands has been constructed to spread the chapters of the Book of Mormon across the total elapsed time of 74 days evenly. Implicitly, the chart then is spreading the distraction times evenly over the 74 days as well. But now we want to know how fast or slow must Joseph and Oliver be going to translate 269,510 words in the Book of Mormon. That's Royal Skousen's number. Is it even possible to do it within this time? The answer is yes. As you can see over here, first column, if you do 10 words per minute, eight hours a day, you can get this many words transcribed in 56.2 days. Now, uh, that's right within the needed time frame. Now, if they were to work faster, 15 or 20 words per minute, or, or if they worked an hour or two fewer per day, they could also get it done in exactly that same time frame. Either way, all of this cuts it very close with all the inter other interruptions that we have to factor in, but it works. Even as Oliver said, by continuously working with all the available time. But in order to know exactly how fast Joseph and Oliver worked, my wife Jeannie and I decided to try it ourselves. We picked two pages in Royal Skousen's Yale edition of the Book of Mormon. Since that version has no punctuation and breaks the lines into thought clauses that would have been about the length of each translational unit. At first, I played the role of Joseph and read the first line slowly and distinctly while Jeannie began immediately writing those words down. When she reached the end of that line, she read it back to me, and I confirmed that it was correct or pointed out mistakes. She hardly ever made mistakes, like Oliver. Then I paused, gazed again at the page, found where we had left off, and read the next line, which Jeannie likewise recorded and read back, and so we proceeded to the end of that page. All the while, we had a stopwatch running, and at the end, we counted up the number of words on the page and the elapsed time and divided by the number of words we counted on that page. Divided that by the number of minutes to get a rate of words per minute for our work on that page. We then did page two. Well, what did we find? First, we found that the experience was so intellectually awakening and spiritually engaging that we repeated this activity in my stake scripture class. We all divided up into groups of three, one person playing Joseph, another Oliver, and the third playing Emma, the close-by timekeeper. The experience was equally electrifying for everyone in the class. Altogether, these results showed that a translation of right around 20 words per minute was quite possible. But we couldn't imagine sustaining that rate hour after hour. Hands got tired, and Joseph needed to catch his breath and clear his voice. We used ballpoint pens. We imagined Oliver dipping and using his quill pen. 
So the 20 words per minute would say you've only got to do four hours of work a day, which does allow time for pausing, resting, and also remember those scattered interruptions that have to be accounted for as well. Well, what did we find uh, beside the 20 or the, the rate? Although not strictly scientific, this exercise produced a flood of experiential insights. The stress of trying to achieve a maximum of accuracy took a substantial toll on us. People playing Joseph struggled to keep their minds focused on the line at hand as they waited for Oliver to finish, as you can imagine. Their thoughts wandered back to the foregoing lines or anticipated what might come next. Usually, our guesses were bad. We noticed more details in the text than ever before. We wondered what Joseph, Oliver, and Emma would have thought on hearing these things for the first time. How long did Joseph pause after Oliver read back a line to him? Did the process work seamlessly, like a teleprompter? Probably not. The Olivers had to be very patient and pay very close attention. And we wanted to pause to enjoy the impressive gems that emerged amidst the blocks of ordinary narration, but the inexorable progress of the stopwatch didn't allow that time. People said, my body was tense. The doctrine and prose was amazingly coherent. It is inconceivable that he was able to maintain coherence under those conditions. Another said, even the long, complex sentences all made sense in the end. It gave us greater appreciation for the line upon line precept. One said, I had empathy for Joseph and Oliver, who did this hours each day. Some said, it was a spiritual experience to get these words a bit at a time coming spontaneously forth. All who did this were eager to try it again with their families, for youth activities, and other classes, with everyone wanting to take turns in all of the different roles. It was an unforgettable hour. Well, let me now turn to a few concluding applications and reflections. How might this information about the speed and order in which the translation happened affect the way we interpret and read the book? Might this information be useful and not just cerebral calisthenics, as Elder Maxwell would put it? For me, I find this subject fascinating. I love this subject because of the many things it does for me. After 30 years, I still find it to be new, intriguing, and rewarding. Inevitably, how a book came to be is an important part of its context. And rigorous historical and critical analysis these days, first and foremost, must contextualize any document or an event for us to understand it on its own terms. Might we then consider how the timing of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon provides important contextual information for reading almost every chapter or verse in the book? This context can provide a pervasive interpretive lens that informatively shapes the reading of every phrase or passage or structure in the Book of Mormon. Should not every passage be considered for how it promotes the Book of Mormon's self-declared purposes to convince readers that Jesus is the Christ, to achieve its originally announced role as a sign that God has set forth his hand again among us, and to fulfill its prophetically extended promise that it will give us power to resist temptation, to overcome doubt, to overcome fear, and to receive heaven's help in our lives. By comparison, can we imagine how different our interpretation of biblical books would be if we knew how much, if we knew as much about those books and how they were composed 
and brought forth, as we know about the Book of Mormon. Imagine how much it would condition, inform, and transform our reading and reception of the New Testament Book of Revelation. If only we knew this much about how it had been written, perhaps even on the Isle of Patmos, dictated to a scribe. Or how about how much and when and under what, what time constraints the epistle of the Hebrews to the Hebrews or the book of Deuteronomy was composed. Now my point is not to suggest that any of these books came forth in a manner anything, anything like the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It is a singular sign, probably in a class all by itself. But just imagine if we knew this much about the writing of any book in the Bible, that information would inevitably and most certainly be constantly in the mind of every reader and commentator of that book. The only reason that such a hermeneutic is not a part of our hermeneutics of the Bible is because we just don't know that kind of information on the origins of biblical texts. But that doesn't mean that we should gauge our reading of the Book of Mormon by tools that were created without such factors at hand. Should not this type of information then be a part of every reading of the Book of Mormon? Knowing the facts of how it came forth, including its timing, its rapid translation, and amazingly rapid if you think about even doing 10, 15, 20 words per minute and not going back to revise the text at all, certainly would inform and may even transform your experience in reading and handling it, transporting us into a more complete and more receptive mode of reading. After all, origin, or Herkunft in German, is not just a hermeneutic key. It is the cornerstone of hermeneutic itself. Knowing that the Book of Mormon was translated in a small, remote, wooden cabin, quite a distance from any village, let alone cities of any size, gives every verse in the book an independent voice, not drawing upon any local libraries or theologically oriented universities. Place and time are both important. And so, likewise, the order, the time, the sequence in which the chapters of the Book of Mormon were composed and translated may give uh, yet another dimension through which to read it. So now pick your favorite aspect of the Book of Mormon, whatever it might be, and consider how you might read it better knowing the sequential dynamics of the translation of the text and other chronological aspects relevant to that topic. I like to look for what I call itty features of the text. I look for various elements like variety, spirituality, complexity, subtlety, consistency, and so on. Substantial and timing factors only amplify the significance of these details and often help me to see things that I otherwise would have missed. For example, looking at accuracy, in Alma 36, Alma quotes exactly 22 words from Lehi found in 1 Nephi chapter 1. The Alma text was translated in harmony about April 24th. And the Lehi text, the source of Alma 3622, was not supplied until after it had been quoted. Oh, that's interesting. Until about June 5th in Fayette. The time separation increases the independence of these two translations, but also raises a number of questions about the accuracy and the nature of the translations and how did Alma, after all, know this passage from Lehi and work it into Alma 36, his otherwise masterful literary composition. Regarding reality, Imagine the detail being preserved that Samuel the Lamanite, when he quoted King Benjamin's sacred discourse to his people at the temple of Zarahemla and gave them the sacred name of the Messiah in, in Mosiah chapter 3, verse 8, he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and of earth, 
the creator of all things from the beginning. You imagine Samuel then quoting on the walls of that very city of Zarahemla, yelling out the holy name back to the people there in their state of apostasy, reject, who had rejected the coming of that Messiah. Benjamin's words were translated on April 7th. Samuel's speech more than a month later on, May 9th. This time separation makes it all the more unlikely that this detail would be accidental and should not go unappreciated. For historicity, notice the book's ability to keep the lifespans of Alma's lineage all in line, scattered over texts that were translated from April 11th to May 22nd, a span of six weeks. And yet, that's not what the book is about, but that thread runs perfectly through. And honesty, honesty. Imagine dictating the 30 names in the Jaredite genealogy at the beginning of the book of Ether, going from Ether at the beginning down to Jared, and then turning around and going through the story of those Jaredite rulers over the next three days of translation, mentioning those 30 names on that list in exactly the opposite order as you introduce them back into the story of the history, now going from Jared uh, down to Ether. Wow. A text uh, like this has a true quality of integrity about it. And chronology played important roles both for Ether and for Moroni in telling and retelling the Jaredite story. Understanding the rapid pace of translation enhances that role. These and many other instances remain to be explored through this lens. One might ask, how do the various instances of the pride cycle develop over time within the Book of Mormon? And how does that presence or absence of this cyclical orientation of the text fluctuate with or against the translation cycle? Or how does the destruction account in 3 Nephi 8, translated about May 12th, relate to the prophecies detailed about that destruction in 1 Nephi 19, translated a month later? The antithetical parallelisms in the words of Alma the Younger, as he came out of his three-day coma, were translated in Mosiah 27 about April 13th. While the intriguing comparison uh, in the related chiastic retelling of that event in Alma 36 was translated about 10 days afterwards, and yet the comparisons are detailed and really quite remarkable. The seven tribes in the Nephite world are named Nephites, Jacobites, Josephites, Zoramites, Lamanites, Lemuelites, and Ishmaelites three times in the Book of Mormon. The first to have been translated would have been in the inconspicuous spot of 4th Nephi, chapter 1, verse 38. And a page later, but coming from a time a century later, the same seven are listed exactly in the same order in Mormon chapter 8, verse 1. He dictated those identical lists, Joseph did, on May 21st and 22nd. More difficult and culturally more meaningful would have been the presence of this precise seven tribe list much later, on June 24th, in rendering the third time this list appears in Jacob 1.13 where we now learn that that, that list had its origins significantly back in the days of Lehi and his son Jacob at the very beginning of the tribes of Lehi. Looking at instances of intertextuality also yields situations where time factors should not be overlooked. The impressive teachings of Abinadi in Mosiah chapters 12 to 15 came forth early in the process about April 10th, 
as John Hilton has shown, 13 cases of Abinadi's phraseology appear in Alma's words to his son Corianton in Alma 39 to 42. Translated on April 6th, about 130 pages later. Those allusions make particular sense because Alma the Younger grew up listening to his father speaking of the doctrines that he had learned from Abinadi himself. And there they are textually and, and temporally, chronologically interrelated. Well, let's take a breath. Now to conclude, let me ask how you might personally react to all this kind of information. Do we react with increased gratitude? Gratitude for God? As Elder Collister has recently said, this book is one of God's priceless gifts to us. for which we should be abundantly grateful. In explaining how the book was translated, Joseph consistently answered on at least nine occasions that it was by the power, by power from on high, by the gift and power of God, direct from heaven, dictated by God. Just as it was given through Joseph's gift of translation, it is equally a gift of the Spirit to everyone who opens and drinks from its living waters. Oliver Cowdery's reaction was also one of gratitude. To sit under the sound of a voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven awakened in me the utmost gratitude, he said. It also can help us feel greater gratitude for Joseph, Oliver, Emma, Martin, David, and all who were involved. Elder Maxwell said, you and I owe many people for their lives in bringing us the Book of Mormon. We can best express our gratitude to them, he said, by reading and applying the teachings of the Book of Mormon. Might you react with increased faith? In the Gospel of Mark we read, I believe, as far as I can go, so help thou my areas of unbelief, as I would paraphrase that. Help me as far as I can go. Help me. I believe, but only as far as I can go. We need help. Faith and trust are closely related concepts along with faithfulness and loyalty. This information that you've been given, though temporal, can speak volumes in enhancing our respect and esteem for the Book of Mormon and our trust in the entire process by which it came forth. In the midst of insert uncertainties all around us, there are things here that we can know with great confidence. The anchor points and the feasibility rate of translation, although staggering, are reassuring. More than enough here to conclude, by a substantial preponderance of the evidence, that Joseph Smith and others told the truth. The manuscripts, documents from diverse people, all converge to substantiate the consensus story that we've been talking about tonight. In 1831, Joseph said that it was not intended for us to know all the particulars, all the particulars, but maybe some, of how the Book of Mormon came forth. And we indeed don't know how the interpreters worked. I doubt that even Joseph knew or could explain how those worked. But what we can know is that the Book of Mormon happened, when it happened, and how long or how short a time that took. At some point we can say, it is enough. An old Croatian Latter-day Saint convert recently testified. Why am I faithful? He asked. I know I will stand before God someday. I don't want to have ever doubted him. Can this information be of help to us in trying to be similarly faithful? 
Or might we experience an increased appreciation, awe, and reverence? The Book of Mormon is worthy of the name miracle. It is a miraculous work and a miracle, not just a marvelous work and a wonder. Elder Maxwell said, one marvel is the very rapidity with which Joseph Smith was translating. The time charted on the schedule you have works, but only on the assumption that Joseph could read directly, line after line, from a supernatural unveiled text. There's no time to make it up as you go along, as you'll experience it if you try to do it yourself. As we've always known, there was no time for research, looking up scriptures, outlining, or composing. But now we can see that all the more impressively. And as Elder Maxwell explains, rarely would Joseph go back, review, or revise what he had already done because there was no need to revise divinely supplied text. And finally, are we filled by this with increased love for God? All this increases my love for my Heavenly Father and his son, Jesus Christ. I can know better that they love and care for me, a mortal, because I know that God cares about time and that he is with his body in space and time. That he knows about the meridian of time and has planned for dispensations of time. He gives signs of the time and he times major events in order to keep his covenants. He gives us time, time to repent, which is the essence of his mercy, as stated in the beginning of Alma 42. He wants to lovingly bless all of us for time and for all eternity. If any of these reactions might be found among our responses to this information tonight, my heart will be thrilled that all these feelings will soften our hearts and make us more receptive to the Holy Ghost to confirm to our hearts and minds the multifaceted and manifest truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Friends, we are uh, very grateful to have all of you here. Um, as Professor Pike said, my name is Spencer Fluman. I'm the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute here at Brigham Young University. And um, I'm, uh, I'm honored to uh, make a uh, special presentation to uh, Professor Welch tonight. This is not customary for uh, our biennial uh, Laura F. Willis lecture, but we wanted to take this opportunity because we consider this a, a special occasion and wanted to mark it in a particular way tonight. Uh, Professor Welch has, it's, it wouldn't be inappropriate to say he has towered over the study of the Book of Mormon for, uh, for quite some time, and we wanted to formally recognize that tonight. I wanted to start um, by reading a bit of a, uh, a foreword written by uh, James R. Rasband, the academic vice president here at Brigham Young University. Um, he was uh, Jack's uh, former dean in the law school and penned the foreword to uh, uh, a Festschrift volume uh, presented to Jack uh, this past summer. With his permission, I wanted to read just a piece of that before uh, we make this presentation to Jack, because uh, Jim said it very well. He, says, he writes, a few years ago, Jack received the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Faculty Lecturer Award, the most prestigious academic recognition awarded by Brigham Young University. At the time, I was serving as dean of the BYU Law School, where I'd been Jack's colleague for the last 21 years. In that role, I was asked to assess whether his contributions had truly been exceptional. 
as the award criteria demands. To answer the question, I, have, I hypothesized writing a history of the university and asking whether the work of a nominated faculty member would merit mention in the long history of the university. Most of us, I suggested, would be thrilled with a footnote. But in my view, Jack's work could merit a whole chapter. With that as a, as a backdrop, um, I would like uh, to invite Jack to come up here while I read this citation that we'd like to present. It's gonna be a photo op, too. We're, uh, we're especially honored tonight, given the, that the Book of Mormon is our, is our subject, to present uh, Professor Welch with, uh, with this plaque that I'll read now. The Laura F. Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies at Brigham Young University in appreciation to John W. Welch, Robert K. Thomas Professor of Law, Brigham Young University, for outstanding contributions to the study of the Book of Mormon, including his influ influential scholarly contributions spanning 40 years, his establishment of the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, and Book of Mormon Central. And we note with, uh, with particular celebration tonight, 25 years as editor of BYU Studies, presented on the occasion of his presentation of the biennial Laura F. Willis Lecture at Brigham Young University, November 8, 2017. And now we'll make Jack sit back down so we can reintroduce him and have him come back up. I'm pleased to introduce John W. Welch to you this evening and to welcome him, his wife, Jeannie, and other family members. Without Jack, as he is familiarly known, we would not be here, and not just because he is the honored presenter. In 1979, he was the founding president of the Foundation for Ancient Research in Mormon Studies, or FARMS, which was eventually renamed the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. The Maxwell Institute sponsors this biennial Laura F. Willis uh, Book of Mormon lecture, and so we come full circle. When Jack founded Farms, my husband Stephen became one of those early volunteers who participated in the activities of the organization, uh, including eating popcorn while stuffing mailers. Those early days of Farms featured borrowed spaces, a lean budget, and many volunteers. One of Jack's ambitious undertakings is the publication of the collected works of Hugh Nibley. Desiring to preserve the writings of Professor Nibley, whose classes he had attended, Jack served as the general editor to gather, organize, edit, source check, and publish the 19 volumes of this collection. During 1988 and early 1989, Jack spearheaded the unprecedented publication of four Nibley volumes focusing on the Book of Mormon, just in time for a Book of Mormon course of study in Sunday school. Jack served on the Farms Board of Directors up to and during the time Farms was brought into Brigham Young University in 1999. In 1979, Dean Rex E. Lee invited Jack to become a member of the faculty for the newly formed Reuben, uh, J. Reuben Clark Law School at Brigham Young University, where he was given permission to teach such seemingly unusual courses as Babylonian Law and the Book of Mormon. In 1996, Jack was made Robert K. Thomas Professor of Law there. Jack accepted the position of Editor-in-Chief of BYU Studies in 1991, and we celebrate with him the 100th issue of BYU Studies Quarterly, uh, published during his years there. Jack's academic accomplishments extend over many fields. Beginning with his early discovery of chiasmus in the Book of Mormon while still a missionary in Germany, he's gone on to study chiasmus in other cultures and writings. He served on the board of directors for board of editors, excuse me, for the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, 
and has helped bring the landmark Matsada exhibit to BYU that resulted in an eventual traveling exhibit uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's organized a section on Latter-day Saints and the Bible at the annual National Society of Biblical Literature meetings and is a contributor to the BYU New Testament Commentary Project. Additionally, he has been a contributing editor to the Joseph Smith Papers and has recently served with the John A. Witso Foundation as a distinguished scholar in residence at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Jack has published and lectured widely. Representative publications include The Sermon on the Mount in the Light of the Temple and Legal Cases in the Book of Mormon. One of his lectures that influenced me personally was his discussion of the parable of the Good Samaritan as a type and shadow of the plan of salvation. Since that time, I have reflected deeply on his insights into that parable. In recent years, Jack has been instrumental in the creation of a website launched in May 2015 called Book of Mormon Central. This website makes available a vast searchable archive of material relating to Book of Mormon research. Because we have gathered for a Book of Mormon lecture this evening, I'd like to briefly share Jack's testimony of this book he has written. With this book, I had my first experience in asking God for wisdom as James 1, 5 challenges, when, as a high school junior, I put Moroni 10, 4 on the line, kneeling by my bedside. I cut my spiritual teeth on the Book of Mormon and learned to recognize the promptings of the Spirit. In a 1988 devotional speech at BYU entitled Study, Faith, and the Book of Mormon, Jack concluded, the Lord has given us a truly marvelous blessing in the form of the Book of Mormon. I pray the Lord will bless us all to love and to know him and this marvelous book that we may thereby come to eternal life. This evening, Jack will share inspiring details about the key events having to do with the translation and coming forth of the Book of Mormon as he applies his inquisitive, faith-filled scholarship. Please join with me in welcoming Professor John W. Welch. <laughs> 